Canada. It's the U.S.'s cold, polite, hockey-loving neighbor to the north, a vast country of snowy plains, forests, and bustling cities. Worldwide, it has one of the best reputations of any country. Many see it as almost paradise, a safer, more equal, more stable version of the United States. For that reason, it's been a major destination for immigrants for decades. Canada, they say, is like America except with universal health care. And also, there's a part of the country that speaks French. But if you went to Canada, today, you might be shocked by what you find. Homeless people sleep in the streets. Tent cities cover entire public parks, including in small cities that had never seen homelessness before. Violent crimes are on the rise. Random attacks on the Toronto subway are making people afraid to use public transit. The universal healthcare system is collapsing. Emergency rooms are closing their doors on weekends. People are waiting for months, if not years, for treatment for deadly conditions. Canadians are living shorter lives as a massive opioid addiction crisis crisis pushes down the country's life expectancy. Simply put, Canada is falling apart. But why? Why is this country with a reputation for being nearly perfect suffering from all these problems? And why are things going to get much worse before they get any better? In this video, we'll answer these questions. But before we do, be sure to subscribe to our channel for notifications on our latest news and analysis. And if you like this video, hit the like button and help us spread the word. Canada is a massive country. It's the second largest sovereign state in the world by land area, but it has a relatively small population. With 40 million people, it has slightly more people than California. A Canadian prime minister from the 1930s, William Leon Mackenzie King, once said, some countries have too much history. Canada has too much geography. But that geography has always been the heart of Canada's economy. Ever since the region was colonized first by the French and then the British, Canada has had a resource economy. First it was fur, then logging and fishing, and in the 20th century, Canada became a major exporter of oil and hydroelectricity. The oil fields of Alberta and the massive hydro dams of Quebec were the lifeblood of the economy. To be sure, Canada had other industries too. There were factories in the cities and financial institutions and ad agencies and all the rest, but the core of it all had always been resources. Importantly, Canada has always lived in the giant economic shadow of the United States. Many factories were branch plants of U.S. firms like Ford and General Motors, Heinz and Kraft and Campbell's Soup. But today, something has gone terribly wrong with Canada's economy. Canadians are getting poorer, both relative to other countries and in absolute terms. A recent OECD forecast predicted that over the next 30 years, Canada will have the slowest growing economy among the OECD countries. A generation ago, Canada was near the top of the pack among the world's wealthy countries. A generation from now, it's expected Canada will have fallen to near the bottom among wealthy countries. At the core of the problem is productivity. Canada isn't growing. Economists will tell you that productivity is the key thing that drives wealth in an economy. Productivity is a measure of how much output an economy creates per worker. The more output each worker produces, the more wealth there is in the country. Canada's Productivity has stagnated. A generation ago, Canadians were as productive as Americans. Today, the average American worker is nearly 40% more productive than the average Canadian worker. The result is that Canadians earn less than Americans. The average salary in the U.S. is around 57,000 U.S. dollars, while in Canada, it's less than 44,000 U.S. dollars. So why is this happening? In simplest terms, it's because over the past few decades, Canadians have stopped making things and have instead refocused their economy on buying and selling houses. Canada transformed itself from a resource economy into a Ponzi scheme where people buy and sell homes for increasingly large sums of money. It all began in the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Canada didn't actually have a financial crisis at that time. Its housing market didn't bust out like the US and British housing markets did. Its banks were sound and didn't need bailouts. But when the world's central banks started to drop interest rates to stimulate their economies, Canada's central bank, the Bank of Canada, did the same. It dropped rates to nearly zero. Suddenly, mortgages were extremely cheap to borrow. House prices in Canada began rising dramatically. At that time, 70% of Canadians owned their own homes, and all those people started feeling richer. They also felt invincible. They saw the U.S. housing market go bust, but nothing had happened in Canada. That gave Canadians a sense of immunity from crisis. With this sense of newfound wealth and invincibility, Canadians began speculating on the housing 
housing market. House prices in major centers like Toronto and Vancouver grew by double-digit percentages every year. It looked like the beginning of a massive housing bubble, except that bubble never burst. Then in 2014, the next phase of Canada's decline began. Global oil prices collapsed, falling by half in the space of a year. Oil was Canada's biggest, most lucrative export. But with the crash, investment in the oil industry began to shrink. Businesses and the government turned their back on oil, and everyone focused even more on buying and selling houses. The flow of business investment money changed direction, away from Canada's resource economy and into buying and selling housing. Canada's high rate of immigration meant the country always needed more new homes, and money flowed into the construction of new residential real estate. Meanwhile, Canadian households were putting more and more of their wealth into buying homes, and less and less into stock markets and all other investments. The money needed to invest in new businesses began to dry up, even as billions and billions of dollars flowed into the construction and purchase of houses and condos. And that trend never stopped. Recently, the amount of capital flowing into residential real estate in Canada has started to exceed the capital going into business investment. That's right, Canadian households and businesses now put more money into housing than they do into everything else combined. This is a totally imbalanced economy, and it's starting to have a very negative effect on the country. With so little business investment, Canada is barely creating any new businesses, and what new businesses there are, are usually bought up by U.S. companies, because in the U.S., businesses still have money to invest. The amount of investment into every worker is now nearly twice as high in the U.S. as Canada. U.S. businesses invest nearly $27,000 U.S. dollars into each worker every year, while in Canada, it's just over $14,000 U.S. Dollars. This is why Canadian workers aren't as productive as American ones. They aren't getting access to the kind of resources their American counterparts are getting. They work with older equipment, older computers, worse software, older factory machines, and so on. And so they produce less. And so Canadians are falling behind. But just as importantly, if not more, is the fact that just as money has shifted towards housing and away from everything else, housing has become incredibly unaffordable. Between 2010 and today, the average house price in Canada tripled, and that happened even as Canadians' earnings stagnated. While this run-up in house prices has been great for current homeowners, it's been a disaster for young people trying to break into the housing market, and the situation has gotten much worse since the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, once again, the Bank of Canada dropped interest rates to zero, and Canadians began borrowing to buy houses faster than ever. Between 2020 and 2022, house prices in Canada soared by 50 then inflation came along, like it did in many other countries, and the Bank of Canada did what other central banks around the world did. It started raising interest rates. This has had a nasty effect on Canada's housing market. Unlike in the US, where you can get a mortgage for 30 years with a fixed interest rate, in Canada, mortgages last five years and then have to be renewed at a new interest rate. You can also choose between a fixed rate for that five years or a variable rate that goes up and down with interest rates in the economy. During the pandemic, variable rate mortgages had lower interest rates than fixed rate mortgages. With house prices so high, many buyers chose the variable rate. About a third of Canadians have variable rate mortgages, where the interest cost can go up and down every month. When the Bank of Canada started raising rates, one third of Canadian mortgages instantly started to get more expensive. Plus, the remaining fixed rate mortgages all come due within five years, meaning even people with fixed rate mortgages are now being forced to refinance finance with much higher interest rates. This put the squeeze on Canadian consumers. Many began to panic. But Canada's banks, wanting to avoid a US-style housing bust, came up with a novel solution. They started increasing the amortization length of mortgages, that is, the amount of time it takes to pay off a mortgage. This lowered mortgage payers' monthly payments, but it also extended the length of those mortgages by a lot. Because the amount of money being borrowed is so high, many Canadians now have mortgages that will take 70, 80, or even 90 years to pay off. This is not a joke. This is what Canadians are facing today. The dream of owning a home has become the nightmare of nearly permanent debt slavery, and all it took was a hike in interest rates. Meanwhile, for first-time buyers, the price of housing combined with high interest rates has made it impossible to buy a home. People are still buying homes, but those buyers are existing homeowners who can leverage the wealth in their current homes to buy investment properties, or their corporations 
buying homes out from under families. A recent analysis found that at current house prices and interest rates, only 10% of Canadians could actually afford to buy a house in today's market. No wonder Canada's home ownership rate is falling from 70% a decade ago to 66.5% today, and it will almost certainly keep falling. Canadians are being squeezed out of home ownership one household at a time. Adding to the problem is a growing housing shortage. Canada's federal government, led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of the Liberal Party, recently increased Canada's immigration levels to around half a million newcomers per year. But on top of new permanent residents, Canada also takes in hundreds of thousands of foreign students and temporary foreign workers every year, most of whom end up staying in the country. The result is that Canada's population is now growing at a rate of 1 million per year, a huge number for a country of 40 million people. Canada's population growth rate is one of the fastest in the world world, on par with some sub-Saharan African countries. And the thing is, Canada's sluggish, underinvesting economy can't keep up with this population growth. The economy literally cannot keep pace with the population, and in the second half of 2022, Canada fell into a per capita recession. Its economy is still growing overall, albeit slowly, but on a per-person basis, it's shrinking. There aren't enough jobs and there's not enough economic growth to keep everyone in the country as wealthy as they were before. Rapid population growth is also causing Canada's once beloved healthcare system to be strained to the limit. None of Canada's 1 million new arrivals per year are able to work as doctors because Canada doesn't recognize foreign medical credentials from most immigrant countries. The country lost a lot of healthcare workers during the pandemic. Many of them quit due to stress or because they disagreed with the vaccine mandates that the government-run healthcare systems imposed. And today, the healthcare system is gaining almost no new workers, even as the population explodes. Equally bad is that Canada doesn't have the construction workers to increase the housing supply to keep up with the population growth. Canada is able to build about 200,000 new homes per year, maybe 240,000 if construction companies go all out, but that's nowhere near enough to house a million new residents per year. And economists say there aren't enough construction workers to build more than that. A recent report from Canada's mortgage insurer estimated that the country needs to build 5.8 million new homes in the next seven years. Years. It's on track to build around 2 million. And all those new immigrants coming into the country? Virtually none of them are going to work in construction. Canada's immigration is based on a point system that values high-skilled labor, that is people with a college or university degree. That means Canada gets high-quality immigrants who can contribute a lot to the economy, but it doesn't get construction workers. With the housing shortage getting worse every day, apartment rents are soaring, up 30% in Toronto in just the past year. And so the country is stuck in a game of musical chairs, where the lowest earning people people are being pushed out into the streets, and homelessness is growing by the day. The worst part is that there is no political will to fix the problem. Canada has four major political parties, five if you count the separatist Bloc Québécois, and none of them have any plan to seriously increase the supply of housing. That's because at this point, with the cost of land and construction so high, they can see that the government doesn't have the money to fix this problem. It would take hundreds of billions of dollars of borrowed money to build those 5.5 million homes, and at today's interest rates, the government can't afford it. Not to mention doing something about housing affordability means house prices would come down, and no politician wants to alienate the two-thirds of Canadians who still own a home and are happy with their massive equity gains. At the same time, none of the political parties are willing to cut the immigration rate. Anytime a politician suggests lowering immigration levels, they're accused of being racist and xenophobic. This is despite the fact that a majority of Canadians, including immigrants, think the government's new immigration levels are too high. In other words, Canada's political leadership is as stagnant and out of ideas as its business community. In the coming years, we can expect to see Canadians dying of preventable diseases, families being forced to live in the streets, and politicians who simply turn their head and pretend the problem doesn't exist. Sadly, Canada's crisis will have to get much worse before the country realizes it has to take action. And if you're thinking of emigrating to Canada, we have three words for you. Don't do it. If you liked this video, hit the like button and help us spread the word. And don't forget to subscribe to get notifications on all our latest videos. In the meantime, check out these videos here to learn more. Thanks for watching.